By grade school, especially by kindergarten and first grade, we see a lot more of an emphasis on education. So some of the things that we might see are weaker phonemic awareness. Um, poor self-expression. A lot of times there's difficulties pulling the right words. So you might see thing and stuff when they have a hard time with retrieving the correct word. Um, I think things that parents often ask about is we see these uh, letter reversals and letter inversions, flipping them upside down. Um, and you can also see that in terms of when they're tackling math problems and reading uh, work or number sequences like that. Um, and when it comes to math, there's difficulties knowing math facts and learning math facts as well. By middle school, we continue to see this. We also see a strong aversion or avoidance of doing work, reading assignments, writing assignments, things like that. Um, we might continue to see the letter reversals while reading. Um, one thing that I often hear from students too is just difficulty remembering facts. It seems as if gosh, you know, I studied so much for this exam, but when I come to it, my mind just goes blank. So there's a poor recall of facts. Um, problems with grammar. The other thing I wanted to highlight, messiness in writing out math problems seems to be a big one. Parents say, I come to his homework assignment and I look at the scratch paper and I have no idea where he started and in what order of sequence. That things seem to be very messy and hard to sort of follow along. Um, and the biggest one in middle school then tends to be trouble with math word problems. And when it comes to word problems, it's sort of trying to figure out what information is relevant and not relevant, and then on top of that, figuring out the correct operational strategies to go along. So I tend to see that a lot. With students in high school, we also see poor spelling. A lot of that seems to carry over. Um, the ones that I want to highlight, I hear a lot of times trouble summarizing information from what they read as well as what they heard. Deciphering between, again, what's relevant and what's not. There's also sometimes a weakness in abstract thinking, that they can be much more concrete um, and having a harder time applying some of those principles to some more abstract concepts. Trouble with open-ended questions on tests, multiple choice with possible solutions laid out tend to be a lot easier. Um, in general, students seem to work slowly at this point, and that is much more noticeable. Parents are always saying to me, it's hours and hours at night, they're up late at night trying to complete an assignment, which it seems like it should take them an hour to do. Um, lastly, that I think is a big thing is because the demand for longer, more complex essay writing comes into play at this point, we see a lot of trouble writing down thoughts in a logical sequence. A harder time articulating what they really mean. Just a couple of common myths to go through. Um, the first one being that having a child with a specific learning disability is not a reflection of how smart a child is. Um, a lot of times I hear, I can't tell if it's sort of a child being lazy or unmotivated. And oftentimes I talk to parents and say, you know, naturally as humans, we don't like doing what we're not necessarily good at. So sometimes I think that's a common misconception. This last one, because parents always ask, um, a specific learning disability is a lifelong neurological diagnosis and it, in theory does not go away. We can certainly provide remediation and support to help offset certain challenges, but it is a lifelong struggle. One important thing I always like to say though is that it's not prescriptive, meaning it doesn't define your child's abilities or upper limits of their capabilities. However, it gives us a description of what their current challenges are. Okay, so I know I'm going kind of quickly just because you know, we have two other presenters. When it comes to executive functioning, generally executive functioning is an umbrella term for all the skill sets that sort of help guide our behaviors, help us regulate our emotions, and sort of plan out the next steps. The list of executive functionings that we look at, we have inhibition, or what we refer to as impulse control. Cognitive flexibility, the ability to shift between task demands. Can I do one thing, put that on hold, and go to another? So it's a little bit like multitasking. 
emotional control and being able to use reason to sort of uh, mediate our emotional responses, planning and organization, organization of materials, and that all has to do with also prioritizing, knowing what's important, what we should do first, last, and things like that. Working memory, a lot of parents have been asking me about this lately. So working memory is not only just the capacity to remember information, but it's also to be able to manipulate that information in some way. So how that comes out to play a lot, for instance, in school, word problems. We have to be able to remember all the information, then while remembering that information, figure out the steps in order to solve that problem, and then actually do it. So all of that comes into play when it, um, the working memory comes into play. And lastly, it's sort of the self-monitoring and attention to detail. As we're going along, are we able to pay attention to the fact that we made a mistake here and self-correct those errors? I once had a, a parent who had said to me, you know, I, my child is working on the wrong assignment and I don't think he would have even known if I didn't stop him and tell him to do so. So that's sort of self-monitoring. So, Looking at this list, it's no wonder that when it comes to sort of academic success, we see that attention and executive functioning have come to the forefront, really. And in this way, so for instance, when we're talking about school performance, if we're approaching a multi-step major project, we have to use all of our executive skills to carry this out efficiently. So for instance, we have to receive all the information, remember all the details, including what are the key aspects that I have to hit, and the due date. We have to also plan enough time, know that if this is due in two weeks and I have other assignments, how can I prioritize and plan this out? We have to start and complete work in the appropriate order, um, and have a list of checks and balances along the way. Another thing is we have to be able to tolerate the interruptions and distractions during work because inevitably the printer will fail, brother or sister will come and bother us, the dog will actually eat part of the project, something might happen and we have to be able to tolerate that. And the other thing is we have to bring the assignment back to school. Many times parents have said, you know, I don't know what happened between leaving the house and getting to school but the homework assignment disappeared somehow. And all of that has to do with executive functioning. Now, keep in mind that there is no specific diagnosis in executive functioning. We can look at weaknesses in, their area, in this area, but there's no psychiatric diagnosis to date. Um, where we often, in most of our research, when we look at executive functioning, are with children with ADHD. We find that attention and executive functioning seem to go hand in hand. Individuals, and what we know, what that research is telling us, is that children with ADHD seem to be about three years or so behind in developing the executive functioning skills. However, by the time, oh, I keep hitting this, by the time we, they reach the early 20s, they seem to have caught up. Um, just a couple of, things. I think that when we look at these lists, Many of us can say, you know, we see we're not so great in certain of these areas we struggled in school. It doesn't necessarily mean that your child or yourself qualified for disorders in these areas or diagnoses in these areas. So the big question is, how do I know if my child needs an evaluation or needs help beyond tutoring? So I just wanted to touch upon this a little a bit. Oftentimes the referrals that I get um, is there's usually a long history of problems um, beginning in grade school. Either teachers repeatedly say, hey, we've been struggling in this area, we're noticing you know, problems here. Or parents who have always had that inkling in the back of their minds and saying, it just wasn't right, there was something that was harder. And usually they see a specific decline in functioning when the workload suddenly becomes harder and the child's not able to compensate. Typically that might happen, for instance, between elementary school to middle school. The other thing is, is that we might see significant disinterest in school, lower motivation. I would say this next one is a big point, that the child needs a lot more support, extra help from teachers, parents with constant reminders for things, um, to be able to maintain their grades. And it's with tremendous amount of effort and support. 
Inconsistent grades is another one. Sometimes parents say, I don't know what happened. They started off with an A, they got a C, they got a B, now they're failing. And they're really sort of at a loss to explain some of these difficulties. This last one, um, poor attention. Because what we know is that um, oftentimes if we're struggling in an area of greater fatigue, our attention might go, our concentration, and also our interest in the schooling. So oftentimes a big question that comes to me is, is it ADHD, is there an attentional difficulty, or is it learning? And evaluation does help sort of differentiate between those two. Um, yeah, it's just, I'm not gonna go much into it. But there are a couple of different evaluations that parents are always asking about. We have the psychoeducational as well as the neuropsych evaluation. Psychoeducational focuses a lot more on terms of the academic and the learning to rule out any difficulties in underlying learning weaknesses, learning disorders, things like that. The neuropsych is much more comprehensive in addition to the learning. Um, this is where the testing for the attention and the executive functioning come into play, as well as any concerns in mood or behaviors. Um, any, we're going to hold off on questions at that, yeah, at the end of the, the session. So I think with that, yeah. So my name is Alice Negert, and my background comes from education. I'm a speech and language pathologist. That was my first love for, um, for many years. And then I went back to school for a master's in um, special education, but I really was starting to look at a doctoral program and um, with children with language-based learning disabilities because many times as a speech and language pathologist, um, I would work with children and I would reach a point and I would discharge the child. And at that time I worked in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I worked for the city school system. And I'd be sitting in a cafeteria and um, somebody would say, oh, I referred so-and-so for an evaluation. And I would say, I fixed them. They're done. <laughs> they like, what do you mean you're referring them back? And what I realized was um, it, the, it was part of a puzzle. Children presented as a, at a certain way when they were younger. Like Rebecca said, the children, children might have delayed speech and language issues when they're children but they still have the same issues. They just manifest differently as they go through the grade levels. So you might not necessarily see a clearly defined learning disability. Um, you might not, you certainly will not see dyslexia. You might not see some of the issues that Rebecca spoke about early on. But as the children and the grade level expectations change, you will see certain manifestations of some issues. So. It, I went back to school to be able to hold my children for a longer period of time and be able to affect change in, in their overall schooling as, you know, as they go through um, the grade levels. Um, what I did find out that what works for the student with learning issues works for everyone. And that's something that I speak with faculty about a lot. A lot of the strategies that we use, every child can benefit from it. So especially when we talk about children with specific executive functioning issues, um, some of the, I'll give you some of the strategies to, that you can use and that have you know, helped children in the past. But a lot of them, if teachers use these strategies in the classroom, they can help all children. It's not necessarily specifically for children that might have documented weaknesses in a, in a certain area. Um, So, what we do know, and Rebecca alluded to this as well, academic success is increasingly linked with being able to use a computer, because everything now, a lot of learning is interactive, executive functioning, and of course basic skills in reading and math, uh, reading and writing. What I see as an aside, a lot of the children that we're speaking about the issues, they have more issues in writing. That's the academic area where the, um, the confluence of executive functioning issues and maybe an evaluation will show that it's the writing piece. 
So why is it the writing piece? Again, what we heard from Rebecca, multitasking is writing is totally multitasking. Math word problems too, but as the children go through the grades, the writing piece becomes more of an issue because once they have their topic, it's not very clearly defined for them, right? They're given the topic. Then they have to figure out, what do I do with this topic? Then they have to break it down into steps. And then the teacher will say, okay, rough draft due in three weeks. What do you mean? And then that week, they'll come home and say, my rough draft is due in three days. Do you have your note cards? What note cards? I needed to have note cards? So, you know, in a school like Barnesville, the teachers are trained, and we were talking, Dory and I, we were talking about this before, the children have a curriculum where they learn how to break parts down into, yes, you need note cards, you have to research it, then you have to organize your note cards, you have to put them into an intro paragraph, a middle paragraph, you have to have a conclusion, you have to have a bibliography. Okay, there are a lot of things you have to do in order to finalize a piece of writing. So for the children that we're talking about that have difficulty with those executive functioning issues, the academic piece of writing is really, really where you'll see a lot of the kinds of issues that have, um, that the kids have, they're manifested there. So again, just to give you an idea, we spoke about all of these, and math and, and definitely um, reading as well, reading comprehension and um, I want to make a point, Rebecca spoke about um, being able to summarize. Some of the children won't, have, won't be able to summarize. So one strategy that's very effective is after the child reads something, to have them paraphrase out loud what they just read. Paraphrasing is a very powerful tool because if you can't talk about what you've read, you don't know it. And children often will say, I know it. I got it. Okay, let me, let's, what did you get? What did you just read? And you'll see that they do think that they got it. Our mind allows us to think that we get things. But unless we can orally present it, we don't, we don't get it as well as we thought we get it. Or they'll give you a very, um, a sentence, a sparse sentence but it won't have any of the details that they really need to show that they um, understand what they read. So I find that one strategy that um, when I work with teachers, having them have the children paraphrase in class, but as parents, it's a very powerful tool if you can paraphrase, um, have your children paraphrase a little bit. Of course, it's helpful if you're doing a novel. It's always helpful if you read the, the novel so you know um, many of the classics um, I've worked with, um, let's say, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, so I know that book now inside and out, so I don't have to reread it anymore before I work with a student on it, and I'm sure many of you have read the books that your children are going to come home with. Um, the history, of course, you would know more so, so you'll get a sense if they're putting in the important facts, but um, definitely paraphrasing is an important tool um, to be able to use. Um, and again, we spoke about the kinds of um, projects and academic tasks that children will have. But, um, you know, the reality is that there, it exhausts a child's executive functioning ability, but it exhausts a child in general. So when children are literally at their wit's end, there's a reason for it. They bring their best game all day long. And having to do the kinds of tasks that school now requires children to do, it is exhausting and it does tax their ability. And as I mentioned before, especially with technology, they can go on, um, you know, get a site from here. They can take, um, many times they need to take at least one source from um, the internet or for, um, from a site on the internet that the, a that the teachers have okayed them to do. So they need that, but then they also need a book source. Um, and then they might have to use their notes. So when they have to integrate all of these pieces, that does exhaust their executive functioning ability to be able to do that. Okay, um, and again, I, we, Rebecca and I talk about myths, but um, if for some reason, by the time the children are in high school, 
there's this concept that they know through osmosis how to take notes, how to study and take tests, how to organize and write an essay paper without direct instruction. But we say, again, that um, they don't know that. So it's become increasingly more important for teachers to teach that. And a lot of times that does not happen um, in schools. OK, so we talk about the writing assignments. So for the younger child, I spoke a little bit about the high school child, but for the younger child, the first thing is self-talk. Self-talk is a very important strategy because it helps you organize the inner system of what is going on um, in, your, in your mind in order to attend to the task. So we all use self-talk when, um, you know, when we're doing a variety of variety of discussions. Some of my best conversations have been when I talk to myself. Um, um, but certainly for children, teaching them to come home, okay, what do I have to do here? What do I need to do first? Putting them in the mindset of being able to say, okay, let's, let's get a grip. What, what do I actually have to do here? And then knowing for a writing assignment. I usually tell the children that they should start with their hardest assignment first. Um, because again, they do become exhausted as they attempt their homework. So, but for writing, when they're younger, they might have a journal entry. Okay, that's a 15 minute journal entry. What do you need to do for that journal entry? Did your teacher give you a prompt? Sometimes they have a list of prompts in front of a writing journal and they can pick one of those prompts. Okay, so figuring out what is it exactly that you have to do. The other strategy, once they do it, if they have it written down, I have the children, and I encourage the parents to underline the verbs in the assignment. So, you know, write a response. Include the setting and the characters in your response. So I would have the child start underlining the verbs. Write a response. Then I have them circle the key words, like setting and character. So they're actually interacting with the direction of what they're being asked to do. That's a strategy that can also kind of help keep them, um, keep them focused on what it is. Okay. You know, my, it's interesting for my PowerPoint, I had the tech integrator at school help me put it together. So I see he put a lot of things into it that I know. I'm like, why is that happening? So, um, so that's, that's kind of fun to see. One example of um, note-taking, some of you might have heard of Cor the Cornell method of note-taking. And you can see that um, there's, again, a strategy to teach children. Key terms and concepts. They keep running notes. Then they have room for their own personal reflections. Um, Note-taking is really important when you work, have to work out of textbooks or you have to work out of articles. So when children are studying for tests, they say, well, I read it. I'm ready for the test. That's not an effective way to study for a test. <coughs> they, the children have the material. They need to be able to take notes and create a study guide. Now again, I know here at Barnstable, some of the children um, the teachers engage in that. They help the children set up their study guides. And then we teach the children that you study from your study guide. Rereading the chapter five times is really not an effective way of studying for a test. So this is just one system that some of the kids I work with use, and they find it is helpful. And then they study just from their note-taking, the pages of note-taking that they have on a particular area. Um, so what are accommodations? And what's the difference between an accommodation and a modification? An accommodation are ways for students to demonstrate what they learn. So if a child has a writing issue and they can tell the teacher the answers, but they're being held responsible for the same amount of material, that's an accommodation. You're not modifying the program for them but you're giving them an alternative way to show you that they know the information. So, um, 
you know, that's something to keep in mind, and that will keep the children at grade level. Okay. Um, putting the notes online, being able to provide copies of notes. Um, we spoke about, um, you know, creating study guides, uh, paraphrasing, checking in time with the teachers is very important. Uh, I'm going to go to time, that's what I want, time management strategies. So a lot of the, um, the children that we're speaking about with these executive functioning issues, they have the time, what Becky, what Rebecca spoke about, time management issues. They really don't know how to manage their time, and they'll spend three hours doing the assignment. No child should be spending three hours at night doing homework especially children that have a tendency to having certain kinds of um, learning issues or executive functioning issues. So there is a way that you, again, you have to approach the homework in a systematic way. Help your child decide what should be done first. Put a number next to the first assignment and continue numbering until the last assignment. And again, I tend to have, I discuss it with the children, but I tend to have them start the most difficult assignment first when they have the cognitive ability to really have the patience to think about what they're doing. Okay, so how long is too long for an assignment? It really depends on the age and the grade level. For the younger children, if they're working more than 20 minutes on a math sheet, 30 minutes max, that's it. You write a note to the teacher, so-and-so worked on this, and that's fine. I mean, most of the teachers I work with are totally fine with having an assignment. They see the child attempted the assignment, they got to a certain point, that's enough. That's enough for that kind of assignment. As they get older, of course, the time will increase based upon the assignment, um, but a child should not be sitting hours on end at night doing an assignment. If that's the case, the assignment is too long for them, or they need some kind of modification where you, I advise you to interact with the classroom teacher and say, look, it's been a couple of times, it wasn't an isolated situation, my child has been spending an inordinate amount of time doing this work, what, how can you help us figure this out? Maybe something can be started in school during a study hall, if the child is in high school, um, there are some guided study periods. At my school we have guided study where there's a teacher there to help the children organize and work on some of these man self time management um, strategies. So with the time they go home, a lot of that time has already been spent in school getting started on it. Um, can children take breaks? Absolutely. Children should take breaks. To have them sit there and you can't get up until you finish the assignment is, is really difficult for many of the children that we work with. I mean, yes, they're going to need, now, they don't necessarily need to disappear for 30 minutes, but a stretch break, I've done jumping jacks, movement is very important for children, getting them up. You know, when I work with um, children in my office, I send them go get a drink, take a bathroom break, we do wall push-ups, so I have fingerprints all over our white wall, because um, nobody goes on the same spot <laughs> as the child before, so we have fingerprints all over. But doing wall push-ups and just getting them out of the seat and changing position really helps um, refocusing. So I'm a firm believer in, in movement. Um, we spoke about written expression, um, providing models. Um, so the reality is every child wants to be successful. Um, and meeting with constant failure really um, diminishes and decreases a child's self-esteem. So to look for ways, even at home when you're doing homework, how to make homework as pleasurable as possible is really um, it's really important to be able to do for the kids. Okay, so that's, that's what I want to say. There was a couple of other points. I just wanted to make a point when um, Rebecca was talking about math word problems. 
the word problems are the same parallel to the writing. So when children are trying to do those word problems at home, a couple of strategies I use are very similar. I have them highlight the keywords in the problem. And again, I have them underline the verbs. What do you need to do? Because when Rebecca was talking about finding out the language, what do I really need to know? And what don't I need to know? Having them interact with the question and looking at the language and circling and underlining what they need to do really helps them prioritize how to do a word problem so they get that step-to-step -step analysis a little bit. And sometimes, the other one other thing before we finish up for math word problems, they need to reread it three times. I have a three-time rule. The, the read it once, I go, okay, I don't get it, I need help. I said, did you, how many times you, I read it once. No, not with a math word problem. You have to be able to read it three times. So you read it once, and you say, okay, I have absolutely no idea what I'm supposed to do here. Okay, then you read it a second time. Oh, okay, okay, I think that I might have to divide on this. By the third time, then they have a better sense. Their anxiety level goes down a little bit. They still might need help, but getting them into the habit of saying, having a three-time rule on a word problem really helps the kids begin to focus on it. Um, and I have noticed that, um, Dory and I were talking about this before, with children with um, executive functioning weaknesses, it's important to do these strategies within the content of what they're learning in school at that moment. To have an organizational coach or work independently of the curriculum, I have found is really not an effective way to teach the children the strategies because it's very hard for them to bring what they've learned in an isolated skill and then apply it to the content that they need at that time to be successful. So try working on these skills if you want to, but try to do it within the academic content of what they need to learn to do their work, and I think that you will have a better result. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Matt Zook. I'm a clinical psychologist. My background, um, I was one of the founders and then director of the social skills programs at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Um, a research scientist at NYU Langone Medical Center and then the clinical director of NYU Child Study Center. Now I have a private practice in Cresco. I specialize in parenting um, young adults and children with anxiety disorders, mood disorders, oppositional behaviors and issues with social skills. So, I'm going to talk about how anxiety affects children in the learning process. And there's three main areas that get affected. One is their ability to pay attention in the classroom. Another is their ability to effectively take tests and show what they've learned. And the third is how it affects their attitude and desire to do homework. So, by a show of hands, anybody here been nervous in the last week or so? <laughs> Good representative group. What happens when you get anxious? Your heart rate increases, your palms get sweaty, your hands shake, your stomach doesn't feel good, it's a really uncomfortable feeling. You um, uh, tend to sweat, and it's just really unpleasant. Now, the human body and the human mind is a wonderful mechanism. As humans, what do we do in unpleasant situations? We leave. <laughs> <laughs> we try to avoid them if possible, right? If you put your hand on a hot stove, you avoid it the next time. If you hear a, a scary noise in the basement at night, you try and stay away from the basement. So those responses to anxiety are what our kids are going through in these situations. So the first one, and I'm, I'm just going to give basic outlines, give a couple of ideas of stuff you can do, and then after we'll open it up to questions. So if you're in a classroom, how many of you have heard, this teacher is really mean? Yeah. <laughs> Sweetest teacher on the planet, nice, been doing it for years, and they're great. 
kids not only worry that they're going to get yelled at, they worry even if the kid next to them is getting yelled at. It just makes them uncomfortable. And what happens? Oh, we want to avoid, right? When we're nervous, we want to avoid. How do you avoid being scared in a classroom? What do you do? You don't become invisible. Stop listening. You stop listening. You daydream, you look out the window, you look at your phone, you head to the bathroom, because, right, we are trained, we are biologically evolved to avoid unpleasant feelings. So if a child is nervous in a classroom, it's almost as if they put earplugs in, right? The data isn't getting in, because they have shut out the thing that's making them nervous, and they're engaging in avoidance. And it can look like ADHD, it can look like lazy, it can look like a kid with stomach problems who's going to the bathroom all the time. That's usually how it shows up in the classroom. <clears throat> and the first intervention, and I'm gonna say this for each piece of it, making a kid feel like they're not doing their job because they're avoiding anxious situations will just make it worse. Yelling at them, or chastising them will generally make it worse. They're nervous. So if you chastise them when they're nervous, they will only become more nervous. So we have to invent or develop strategies that can help them manage their own anxiety. You'd mentioned self-talk is a great one. Using a, 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 I use an anxiety thermometer on the desk, well, how anxious are you really? Is there a reason to be anxious? Are there, are there um, uh, like I call them, reality checks? So, you know, my teacher is going to be really angry at me if I don't finish this worksheet. Like, let's say that's something my kid is anxious about all the time. You have them put on their desk. The last time the teacher yelled at somebody for not putting a, a finishing a worksheet. So they can actually check. They can do a reality check to see if their, their worries are real. So one concern is losing attention in a classroom. Another one is test taking, and there's a million different ways this can actually manifest itself. The most common is a kid feels that they've prepared themselves for a test. And there's a 25 question exam put in front of them. And they don't know the answer to the first one. What happens if you get question one wrong on a 25 question multiple test, you get a 96. Not so bad. But they don't recognize the answer to the first one. Oh my gosh, I studied the wrong stuff. Uh-oh, mom was right. I should have studied another half hour. I don't know this. I'm going to fail. Now, the really anxious ones, not only am I going to fail, I'm not going to get into the college I want. And I'm not going to get the job I want and I'm not going to be able to support my family, and I'm going to live in a cardboard box <laughs> underneath the I-80 overpass. And you think I'm kidding. No, I have no. one of those. Yeah. <laughs> right? So they get panicky if they don't uh, get, you know, see something familiar on the beginning of a test. And again, it's stuff like self-talk. I mean, it's too, each kid is different what you need to go through with them to help them manage their own anxiety. But in basic terms, positive self-talk, learning not to catastrophize their own physical sensations, right? Mm. So our body's doing what it's supposed to do when our heart rate increases, our breathing gets shallow, our stomach gets upset. You know, the reason our stomach gets upset when we're nervous is because blood flow to the stomach is diverted to major muscle groups in the body so we can run faster and we can fight. It's a natural thing. And I'll tell kids, you know, you feel the same way when you play baseball, don't you? Your heart rate increases, you're breathing quickly. It's not a bad thing. These things are not necessarily bad things. Just when you're nervous, you immediately think, oh my gosh, there's something terribly wrong. So you help them normalize their anxiety, you teach them positive self-talk, relaxation exercises. All of these things can be really helpful. And then teach them you know, you can keep going through. Don't get nervous. Get to an answer you know. 
Don't get stuck on number one when you don't know it and start to go through that negative feedback loop of how terrible this is going to be and you're going to be living in a box. Keep going. Get to number three. Get to number five. You'll, you'll see one that you know. Whew, okay, I studied the right stuff. But I think the biggest issue that I hear from parents most often is that homework is a nightmare. Anybody? Kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they throw stuff, they rip up papers, they curse at me, they tell me I'm the worst parent that ever lived. Why am I torturing, you know, why are you torturing me, Mom? Why are you torturing me, Dad? Um, and it comes back to that piece called avoidance, right? What do we do when we feel like garbage? What do we do when we feel bad about ourselves? What do we do when we feel nervous and our heart rate's going, all that stuff? We want to avoid it, right? And fortunately for kids today, there are so many wonderful ways to avoid homework. Yes. <laughs> Anybody have a kid that plays video games? <laughs> uh, um, they can get lost in this stuff, as you know, for hours and hours and hours, and it is so engrossing, and they are designed in such an insidious way to get from this level to that level and acquiring shields and pieces and stuff that you can effectively get lost in there for hours. And then you come up and you say, John, you know, I want you to turn off the video games and, and can, we're, we're going to start math. Okay. <laughs> it's not necessarily going to go well. They're going from something, one, that's really enjoyable, two, completely avoids the whole thought of school and everything that makes them anxious, and, and third, kids don't like to listen to what we have to say anyway. So it, it's, it's really difficult. So with homework, you know, I know you're going to kill me for this, structure and predictability are probably the most important pieces. When does homework start? Oh, after you've had a snack and relaxed. And, no, no, homework starts at 4.30. Oh, Tuesdays, it can't start at 4.30. You have baseball, it starts at 7. So that it becomes predictable for them. They know when you're going to come and ask them to do it. They know what's coming next. You know, and if necessary, there's consequences for not doing it. You put in behavior modification plan. The other thing is that I, I work with parents on focusing on starting doing homework. When, when it's in a bad spot and homework is a nightly fight, I try and explain to people, you know, you, you gotta look at the, the war, not the battle. And for the long term, if you focus on just starting, I just, you know, Sarah, I just want you to sit down and start your homework at 4.30. And if you can do that with a calm voice and a calm body, that's success. That's enough. You'll do as much as you're going to do. And the parents tell me, but you're crazy. They have to do their homework. I usually look back and say, how much of the homework were they doing before this? <laughs> or would you rather teach them to feel good about being a student and feel good about being successful? Or worry tremendously about seventh grade history, and I'm sorry, you know, for any <laughs> teachers who are here, but, you know, it, it just I feel that in relationship, the learning of the proper skills and the proper attitude is the more uh, fundamentally important piece. So, um, anxiety uh, affects kids in all of those ways academically, and then it can lead to uh, a slowly declining sense of self-worth. You know, kids have three jobs. Do well in the family, do well at school, and play really well with your friends. Right? That, that's all they have to do. So if they're anxious about school, there's a chance that it can put a dent in all three of those domains. And especially about feeling good or poorly about themselves as a student. If kids can learn to feel good about themselves as a student, it changes the whole ballgame. So in any way that you can, just reestablish things so that they feel successful at whatever the task set before them is. If they can't be successful in doing 
you know, I hope there's not three hours of homework, right? But if you can't feel successful in the 45 minutes of homework, okay, then be successful and do 20 minutes of homework. We'll, we'll get to the rest, we'll figure it out. You'll get help at school, we'll, we'll find some way to do it. We, meaning parents and children, get to define what success means in this family. And if we say success means you can do 15 minutes of homework and feel good about it, then that's good, okay? because then they maintain a good sense of self-worth, which will help them through it all. The last piece is uh, really, really simple. And it's the hardest one to follow. I'm a parent also. Yelling doesn't work. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> There's trends in schools now that are saying that it's possible that uh, giving homework is not an effective. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> I've heard it. I mean, I've actually heard that there are some people doing some research out there and they have decided that homework is not necessarily beneficial. I think the, the intent was more that the amount of homework mm -hmm. maybe isn't um, uh, necessary. That, that uh, Did you guys? I also know in school there there's a trend I think with some of these progressive schools in the city where they're not doing tests the way that we were sort of accustomed to as well as homework. I think it also tackles this this idea of too much homework and they're looking at different ways of evaluating how much a child knows versus standardized testing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Also it depends on the subject area. The children need math homework because they need the repetition and review of the skills. So they should be learning the concept in school and homework is supposed to be practice reinforcement. and reinforcement of the concept. So math homework has been shown to be an effective tool for furthering a child's ability to understand math. So I think it's, it's it depends, but yes, I've, there, there are different schools of thought on it. The research is still leaning towards the benefit, though, mm -hmm. of homework and, and having, you know, within subject areas. And you, you can tell your child, you know, when he's old enough to become a principal <laughs> and affect the rules, but yeah, the, rules in our, the rules in our school are, you know, and it will affect your grades. Right? If I'm not mistaken, Northern Highlands and Allendale does not do homework on weekends anymore. And I'm sure that's wow. because the parents were just. It's a good done. compromise, right? And I know they have a thing about vacations too. They don't want the kid, you know. Yeah. They yeah. Public schools were weren't allowed to assign book reports over the summer, and yeah. they weren't allowed to have them do the first day back because it wasn't allowed to be Kills assigned until. Right. <laughs> Secondly, um, our my son's child, my grandchild, was at a school in younger years where the math teacher did not assign homework because she wanted to be sure every kid understood the concepts mm -hmm. before they go home and screw it up right. completely. Reinforce. So, and I thought that was great because I hate homework, but, you know, <laughs> there's some, there's some, I mean, right. I've actually seen it more in the younger schools where they don't do homework. Mm -hmm. I haven't as much in the middle schools right. and high schools. Yeah. My daughter so in the second schools. grade, they'll only give, the, it depends on the child, so they'll only give the child homework if they feel that they need that. Um, so oh, that's kind of like a punishment. I know. <laughs> but, yeah. And then, and actually, our district, the first month of school, there was no homework. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's supposed to be like 10 minutes a grade? Like if you're in sixth grade, mm -hmm. an hour, mm -hmm. seventh grade, mm -hmm. an hour, ten. Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of homework coming out of school. I don't either. <laughs> or maybe the kid can do it on his own and we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Nicholas goes to Den. It's the, the <laughs> yeah. best thing I did was get out of the homework cycle. Yeah. His, his grades skyrocketed, his confidence and everything else. When I was able to be, it's when I'm working with a parishioner who's dealing with an older parent, you need to get a caregiver in so that you can just be the, you can just be the right. child and not have to be the caregiver for your parent. Your parent needs you to be the child. My son needed me to not be his teacher. Mm -hmm. Forever. <laughs> yeah, the strain it and, can put on a parental and the, relationship. And it is. changed, it changed every aspect of our life. And I love what you said about in our family we decide what success yes. is. Yes. Yes. 
Um, that's something that Barnstable has been really great at. See, I, I, to me, this, there's been a whole turnaround since this kid has been here. Maybe because he's learned I can do it myself. Yeah. Because I don't know how to do it. You know? <laughs> but, and, 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 and then it turns into a struggle when the parent doesn't know how to do it either, especially math. Right. So I, something magical has happened here yeah. and without them so far. So. And the, the thing that and it just happened last week in our house was that Nicholas, for the first time since fifth grade, asked my opinion on no. something he was writing. Mm. Mm. And I was like, and so when it was done, I, I remembered all the things I've been taught. Mm -hmm. And I, we, so we did it, and then I said, this was, I want to thank you for asking me all that. And he looks at me and says, Mom, you're right here. Who else would I ask? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, have you been living in this house for the last five years? Because I can tell you it wasn't me. <laughs> With the test anxiety thing, um, do, do you think it's just the kid putting pressure on himself, or is it home pressure? Or I mean, to me, if you do the best you can do and it's a 75, that's great. Mm -hmm. I'd rather it be a 95, but mm -hmm. and maybe they know that deep down. I mean, I think it gets into individual differences. Some kids are perfectionistic, and it doesn't matter what's said to them or not said to them. They just internally are driven. Some kids are really competitive. Some kids do have pressure at home. Some kids, it's perceived pressure. Like mom and dad, you know, it's, it's rarely is it, do I hear, you must get an A. If you don't get an A, you're in trouble. I mean, certainly parents will say that. But you know, it's the little add-on comments I'll tell parents, whatever it is you were going to say after but, just yeah. don't say it. <laughs> you know? I think you guys did really you did really well on this test. But I see yeah. 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 what do you think about incentives? I think they're great. That's all right to do that. Absolutely. Dangling carrot because somebody said that was not like a good way to comment or would, so. would, you, would you go to work without a paycheck? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that, yeah. it, again, it has to be planned, you know, you don't spring it on them. Look, I see that you're struggling in getting papers done, and it looks like doing the outline is a real problem for you. Let's go out for ice cream if we can accomplish this together. Or it can be if you do your studying for 15 minutes a day with a calm, you know, calm, I would say, a calm voice, calm body. If you can do that, we're going to save up money for Mets tickets or, yeah, whatever you want to do. I think incentives work really well. I just want to make a comment about the test anxiety. We live in a culture now where testing matters. And I think when we um, say to children, oh, don't worry, it doesn't matter, we're not being truthful to them either, and they know it. It does matter, whether we like it or not. Testing does determine placement, whether it's in an honors class, in an AP class, whether it's an SAT. We have in New Jersey park testing. We have a lot of that, and I think that there's a certain amount of honesty that said, I know you're feeling anxious about it. Testing is part of life. And, and I think that that is part of it. And they are concerned how they fare in relation to their peers um, and how they're going to look and am I going to look stupid and what if I don't test out high enough for that honors class but all of my friends yeah. in my peer group do and I'm the only one taking regular math. And of course, being saying in the long run, you're going to take geometry. It doesn't matter if you take it this year or next year, you're going to take it. But in that moment to that child, it's very hard for them. And I think the concept of balance is really because the testing is really um, all over. Do they share grades? Like when you hand out the test, if somebody took a math test, does everybody else see what everybody else gets? Not in the class. I mean, they can outside of the go and talk and say, hey, what did you get? I actually was curious, because I mean, for not just our students, but for adults as well, it's sort of like you have your reality, your perception of it, and then your experience based on your perception, which is something that we, happens to all of us. So for our students, it's almost like, what are the strategies to get to the strategies? Because for a lot of our students, I think there's such a resistance, like the, re the reality checks. Mm -hmm. Love that idea, 
Mm -hmm. I can think of a number of students who are going to go, I'm not doing that, yeah. you know, and sort of like, so what are some strategies to get to the point where they can actually use the strategies, if that makes sense. You could know every strategy, yeah. right, but lead in the water. But if yeah, they don't exactly. want to, yeah, right. Right. exactly. Right. So, it's you know, what, what are the roadblocks? You know, I don't want this to take to my desk where everybody mm -hmm. else can see it. Right. Okay. You know, is there? Do you guys use Chromebooks in the classroom? Is it something that can pop up? Is there a practical solution for some of this? Can we incentivize you to use this? I get it. It's really uncomfortable. A lot of kids also, you know, I hear a lot. Well, if I need this, I, I don't. Know if it, it makes them feel stupid that they need mm -hmm. extra attention, extra help, extra whatever. So, you know, it's hard to say how you make a kid change that perception that help equals stupid. Um, you know, it's kind of more like a, I mean, I consider that to be more like a therapeutic right. issue. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say incentivizing, using practical solutions, pointing out that everybody needs help in things, but that you do all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, use, I use sports analogies a lot, you know. Uh, then why is there a hitting code? I mean, this is Derek Jeter we're talking about. Um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing, too, is that I always start off smaller. Because I think when the child feels successful, a lot of times we're approaching these, and even with adults, when we're teaching like certain skills, like relaxation techniques, mm -hmm. a lot of adults think it's kind of hokey and yeah. silly. Um, but as they start practicing, and sometimes I'll approach it like it. You know, it sounds so silly. I know. But just try it with me a couple of times. Mm -hmm. The early successes that you have are usually, I think, motivating enough to say, okay, maybe we'll give this a shot. Mm -hmm. um, so I always start off small. And just challenging enough, but that they have to feel successful with it. Right. Anything to get started, yeah. yeah. I want to see them have 85% success. So let's say the strategy is, I can't even think of one off the top of my head, but, but whatever it is, or it's a behavior modification plan and we're targeting th three behaviors, two of them I want to be something they're already doing, you know, so that you just add that one on, oh, look, you already got two out of three. So I guess if there's some way also to maybe group it with something more pleasant. Um, but I would use, I do do the motivation, the incentive yeah. at the end, saying, I know, just bear with me. Right. If you try it out, Let's see how it works. Mm -hmm. But either way, like we'll be able to get something that you like. Sometimes I find it could be used like for younger children. One of um, one of the children I was working with, the teacher said when the child came in, he would just drop his book bag, and that's it. And she was working with him on, you have to put your book bag in, take your homework out, put the homework in the bin and then you can talk to your friends. So I said, okay, we're gonna put an index card on your desk with just a check sheet. I'm gonna write mm -hmm. on it, backpack to cubby, and all you have to do is check. Well, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the fact, the idea that it was going to happen was enough <laughs> that all of a sudden, <laughs> the teacher motion goes, okay, what did you do? I'm like, what do you mean, what did I do? He came in this morning, put his backpack in the cubby, and actually took the homework out. It didn't get into the bin yet, but at least, mm -hmm. to Rebecca's point, at least he did something towards that, because the idea of having that index card yeah. was motivated. Yeah, it's the, like when you threatened to, to take out your phone and videotape a kid having a tantrum and put it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so my thing is, why can't every child in the class have an index card? So actually what I was going to add to that is a lot of times when I'm teaching certain techniques to kids, I say, well, it's not just going to be you who does it. We're going to bring mom and dad in here and we're going to do it together. Mm -hmm. And I often, for the younger kids, say, teach your siblings. You know, have the, the family practice this yeah. skill because it's a good skill to have. And I think that we can generalize it to right. everyone. Yeah. And sometimes that can be helpful. Too. Yeah. Well, there's one more thing. We used to, there was this program called OTMP at NYU, Organization Time Management Plan. And there was like tags that you'd put onto your backpack mm -hmm. that had instructions and things you'd safety pin it into. And kids were really resistant. What we did is we made note cards and we wrote like in green marker. 
put your papers in the file folder. And then red marker, um, put your file folder in your backpack. You know, we did the steps in color, and then for the reminder on the desk or something, we would just do red, green, blue. Yeah. So you could just run on the desk, just start a marker, and, you know, put the three dots. Right. And sometimes that's enough to remind them also. That's great. I've seen also, um, like, for kids that don't want like those physical reminders and feel more comfortable like with their phone, like if you take a picture of like the way like your cubby should look when it's like done or like whatever, and then like have that picture, and then they just need to pull it up and like this is what it should look like. Yeah. So you know that's the help. The visual is helpful too, and have them actually like create that picture with their actual stuff or like when your room is clean or whatever it may be. How you want to look when you leave for the day. Do you have your backpack? Is your water bottle there? Do you have everything? Like, I mean. I, I have a question about those two testings that oh, you sure. did. What would be the advantage of having them done with your ch children? I mean, if you could say, yeah, my kid meets every one of those checkpoints, I know. Sure, so generally what it comes down to in the referrals that I get is, well, my child is really struggling whether it's academically, socially, if there's a concern in mood, and diagnostically, we're having trouble pinpointing what it is. So that's one of the reasons why a referral might come in. When you're looking at a, a learning disability, that is actually diagnosed specifically with an evaluation. So you can look specifically at, that's where the psychoeducational comes in and the learning evaluations, I know that Allison also does. So that diagnoses the learning disability. It also takes a look very closely at what a student's strengths and weaknesses are, how well they're able to organize and plan. And sometimes it's, I go into the classroom um, to do observations, so a lot of times it's looking and seeing how that translates into real world settings. Um, so when it comes down to a lot of it is diagnostic clarity. It also, oftentimes when you're looking at school accommodations, which can be very helpful, typically speaking, they often ask for evaluations. It's a little um, fast. To be able to guide that. Hours wise? So the psychoeducational, if you're looking at mostly just the learning, I would say about four to five hours. A complete neuropsych usually takes about six to eight hours. And I always give that range because I can never predict how quickly students are able to finish. And sometimes when I'm testing and I'll look at the scores, if I see something fishy that comes up, I might want to add a couple more tests in that area. But it is long. You do this like on a private basis? I do. You break it up um, into days? It depends on the child. Okay. Older children and adults sometimes will come in and want to do it all in one shot. It's a very long day. Other children want to do it in one to two hours at a time. So in some ways, there's no comparison to what is done in school. It's similar. It's actually very similar. It's more in so depth, though. It's it much more, more, I find it's much more in depth than yeah. what the school does. And sometimes what happens is I offer consultations where families will come in and say, I've gotten this through the district. Mm -hmm. We'll take a look at it. And I'll say, you know, we might want to flesh out mm -hmm. some of these things further. Mm -hmm. And then I'll Stern add areas. to that. Right. Um, I've had the same experience. Exactly. And yeah. school districts, you know, it's free for the families. Private evaluations do tend to be costly. The insurance gets tricky. Um, but it is a much more in-depth. Schools don't do neuropsych evaluations. They will send out for those. And what does that entail? So the neuropsych evaluation is the learning piece, but it's also the attention and the executive functioning, the organization planning, task initiation, all of that, as well as if there's a concern in social functioning. Um, or is my child anxious or depressed? So the neuropsych is the comprehensive. It looks at everything. How many hours is that one? That's six to eight hours. Okay. Yeah. Just as an, another aside that we didn't mention for, I don't know if, how many parents here are high schoolers, but if you child um, wants extra time on tests, you need to have documentation in order to send to the SAT and ACT companies and they need, the documentation is an evaluation. Interestingly enough, I just had a child that um, was evaluated by um, Bergen County. The child attends private school, so it's Bergen County Special Services does the testing. The child did not test out it needed because, as Rebecca said, the testing is not as extensive. And I was surprised because I knew this child for a very long time and I'm like, she was a little bit of a victim of her own success because she was an overachiever and she did so well on the testing that they did in school, she didn't 
a qualify, but we knew that she, she had a specific it. reading disability. So I did more extensive testing, and sure enough, the results show that the child needed, that she needed extended time. So she's a junior. So you do need these kinds of evaluations. What's the testing that you do? Well, I do um, learning more specific to the academic testing. So I'll test if a child has a specific reading disability, a speech and language, a receptive and expressive language disability, um, and or writing. So it's more specific to the academic area. And as a speech and language pathologist, I look into the language functions of being able to express. Is the child speaking in sentences? Are they well developed? Um, I'll do a little uh, work with working memory. Is the child able to follow directions, understand directions, and how does that manifest into school? One of the important points that comes out of an evaluation is within the area of reading um, and being able to say, does the child have a specific reading issue? 80% of what children need to do academically in school is related to reading. Even if it's use of the technology, you still have to be able to read the whatever it is on it. So a lot of it, the work that I do is related to seeing if the child has a language-based learning issue that's impacting their academic performance and what kinds of accommodations. Sometimes it could simply be the child, I'll suggest that the child read the novels on a Kindle. For many children, it's much easier for them to sustain their attention reading on a Kindle than it is on a novel where the print is really small. So sometimes that could be, you know, an accommodation that comes out of uh, that testing. So sometimes they're not right. accommodations that are so, um, you know, difficult. Some accommodations can be very impactful in a very, um, you know, basic way. There's something like that. Right. But for the extended time piece, um, moving forward into the high school, you really do need um, an evaluation and as we said the county ones don't always pick up the in-depth need especially if the children have had a good education and as I mentioned that they're overachievers and they at grade level um, we always talk average goes from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile but I will tell you with a certain amount of confidence that children who fit in the 25th to the the 40th percentile, they're going to struggle in school. But on the test guidelines, they say average. So sometimes that more extensive testing will investigate, you know, that piece of it. So it's something to keep in mind. Because districts actually want you to be well below 25th percentile. Yeah, I think yeah. 16. Yeah. I think it's like, thir well, it has to be Is 33 percent. But yeah. yeah. Two or more areas. And <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. They have a formula. And do you do testing also? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, actually, from the clinician's point of view, if I'm working with a kid with social skills issues or I'm working with a kid um, who has self confidence issues, a lot of the information that I get from the testing is really important. I mean, you're, you know, if your kid's working with a psychologist, they should be looking at all the testing data. You know, is there stuff to show that they have been flexible cognitive sets? You know, real hard time switching uh, from one activity to the next. Mm -hmm. Are they having an expressive language problem? Are they having impulse control issues? I mean, all this stuff shows up on testing. Mm -hmm. And in reality, you, you're spending money on testing, but probably the amount of sessions you cut off with your psychologist because they're not just listening endlessly to the kid tell stories about what happened on the playground. You kind of have a decent idea of what to focus on. It's really helpful. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have one question. So you talked about um, structure and routine mm -hmm. as something that was uh, a very good um, way for, for, for a child to so what happens when they transition from high school to college when that structure is not there and they have Monday, Wednesday, they have a Tuesday, you know, when that all changes, what what do you suggest for, for that transition with regard to anxiety and how they deal with it because they're in a, I mean, they're in a dorm, they're away from home, it could be an hour, it could be four hours, it could be, you know. Yeah. Um, so if it really hits them 
freshman year of college and they've really already made that transition and now the lack of a structure, the lack of support from home, the lack of you know all these uh, you know support at their high school, all of this is gone, and they're really struggling. You know, uh, working with either somebody at the college to help them establish a structure within there, so they usually have TAs, they have uh, support uh, services for students, you know, people to kind of help them. And then they can begin from there what's called scaffolding. Mm -hmm. So like if you're working with a middle schooler or a high schooler and you have a lot of structure set up for them, you want to, to yeah, it's called scaffolding, mm -hmm. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you start with maximum support and then start peeling back. Okay, so here's the incentive program for you. You know you have to start your homework at 430. Well, you know, you have all these structures set up and then slowly you transition to the kid being more independent. Put that reminder on your phone. I only want to check your homework at the end of the week. I'm not going to check it every day. Uh, you know, you only have problems in math and English. I'm just going to check those two. So you try and draw back, you know, just like you do. You walk them to the park when they're young, and at some point they walk to the park on their own, but you stand in your phone. <laughs> so the same kind of a thing. Then once they get there, it can be tough. But... Uh, utilizing the college support system, I would say, would be the best bet. One of the things I always, and I just actually am working with a family right now who is transitioning into that, more and more what I'm seeing is that many colleges are developing programs yeah. specifically to help children with special needs. There is an added cost typically associated with it, but these are programs that really teach all the independent living skills, the executive functioning, this note-taking, things like that. So there are colleges that are now really like especially children with learning differences i've seen a lot more show up with kids on the spectrum or or asperger's um so there are programs built into it if your children has or a child has a documented disability the thing that i always encourage you know seniors and families once they know which school they're going to is to contact the school right away get all the paperwork and everything into play because you don't, if you expect your child to do it, they're not going to actually <coughs> contact people until two months in when everything is already a bit too late and they're going to be playing backwards. Every school also has a wellness center. If you think that your child needs emotional support, I always encourage parents <coughs> just to go ahead, help the child get connected because otherwise you're expecting them, if they're not living with you at home, to do it themselves. Um, I know that parents are always saying, it seems like we're always hand-holding these kids when will it stop. With kids with special needs, they do tend to need a bit more assistance and guidance um, until they're able to get there. But that's what I always say, is definitely be proactive with colleges. Get your child enrolled, get the school familiar with who your child is first before classes start. So I was just thinking too with the scaffolding, correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think a big part of it too, sort of going into the college pieces, as you're sort of weaning them off, so to speak, is improving upon that executive functioning skill of self-monitoring so they know when it's not working for them. That way when they go off to school, they can say, whatever I'm trying right now isn't working and they can adapt much quicker as opposed to sort of us always coming in and saying, kind of the hand-holding, but even more so like as they get older, saying, you know, it's more like a self-reflective process of, you know, think about this, you know, is this working for you? I don't know, you know, you're the one who's using it, not me. You know, so I think if we can improve upon that, mm -hmm. as opposed, you know, within that process, then it's sort of when they do go off to school, they have a good sense of what already does work for them and what doesn't. And they can sort of adapt themselves as opposed to needing somebody else there. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.